and I go to a comedy club in New York, I know that most of the time I'm watching unpolished work that a comedian's trying to work on for maybe a future special or a larger segment and that they're going to consciously try to push the boundaries and yeah sometimes they go too far but the audience lets you know that so it's like a game back and forth of like all right I'm going to say some shit some of it might be offensive some of it not be but in a year from now I'm going to have this super polished thing on Netflix but now we're just talking yeah, and you know, part of the reason that actually a lot of comedians now, I know Rogan does it and I'm pretty sure Dave Chappelle does it, they don't mm -hmm. allow phones in the crowd anymore because it's like you're working through this stuff. That That's like, you know, the, the strange thing about stand-up and why so many stand-ups are sort of bananas is that, you know, most art, it's like if you're in a band, you can practice in that garage for months before you do that show, right? If you're a painter mm -hmm. or a sculptor or anything else, you can c craft your piece separately and then you present it in a gallery. Stand up, imagine being up there, you gotta paint the canvas in front of everybody, but not just present it at the end. Every time you put a stroke on that on that canvas behind you, you gotta be like, hey guys, reaction, reaction, was that the right yeah. one? Mm -hmm. And it's like, you're trying to build something. And I think that that in and of itself lends itself to a certain a certain amount of crazy because you have to practice. And, and you know the whole point of being a comic is you got the line here, the line of what is acceptable. Well, you want to get pretty damn close to that line, but we see it all mm -hmm. the time. Sometimes you're going to trip over. And if you're going to let the mob destroy you because of that, you're probably in the wrong business. Mm -hmm. So you describe three flashpoints in your book that led to the breakthrough moment of you seeing the left as no longer liberal. Those three moments were Cenk Uger's attack on the conservative commentator David Webb, Ben Affleck's meltdown against Sam Harris on Bill Maher, and the Charlie Hebdo attacks. For you, what do you see as the underlying unity between all three of those flashpoints? Ah, love that question. So instead of having to tell all three stories again, which I've yes. been telling, telling repeatedly, hopefully people can read the book and, yeah, they can, and uh, get... They can there you go. There, all the stories are in there. So the, the unifying principle of those three stories is that what I saw happening on the left was that there were really complex issues that we should be able to talk about, that instead of talking about those complex issues, the left just decided to label everybody bigots and racists and homophobes and the rest of it. So that is the through line through those stories. So the, the Affleck story where Bill Maher and Sam Harris tried to explain that you could be critical of ideas and without being bigoted towards people, and what did he say? You're gross and racist and he did it while he was screaming and the whole thing. Uh, the Charlie Hebdo one, it's like, people should be allowed to make whatever art that they want and should not be killed for it. But suddenly I saw lefties saying, no, 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 maybe let's not just upset those people. They don't want us to draw those things. Well, it's like, if you say, okay, well, they're telling us not to draw those things or they're gonna kill us. Are they okay with the gay bar in your neighborhood? Probably not, but you're supposed to be for gay rights and, and a series of other things. And then um, the David Webb one, which is David mm -hmm. happens to be a black, uh, conservative. And I saw a bunch of colleagues talking about him and he's a black man who was saying things that they didn't like. So they felt that that gave him, them a license to call him a bigot and a racist and a self-hater and a grifter and an Uncle Tom and all of the worst things in the world. And I thought, well, wait a minute, you guys are calling everyone racist all the time, but you're racist. You're actually racist because how dare this black man say something that you don't like, oh, tolerant liberal one. Uh, so all, I would say the unifying principle of those things is that there are, there are seriously complex things that we have to discuss in this world, mm -hmm. whether it's actually about racism or whether it's about separating ideas from people or whether right now, how we're, how we're talking about opening up the economy. It's like, we've got here in California, it's like, we're shutting down the beaches. That's it. Well, of course, it's a progressive governor doing that when instead he could be doing something honest, which is saying, hey, instead of shutting down the beaches, they can be at half capacity. You have to leave a space in between your car in the parking lot and the car next to you. Um, we're going to delineate areas in the sand for groups of four. And they're going to be like, that would be a mature way to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. But it's very consistent with progressive ideology that instead of doing anything maturely, honestly, how do we come to these conclusions? Bernie, you just make up $15 minimum wage instead of show. I've run a business. I know that that's not the way a business should be run, that you just mm -hmm. make up how much people should be paid. Bernie's never run it, but he says it because it sort of sounds morally right. And that's what they do with virtually every topic there is. And so the through line is we got to be able to talk about things in a complex way, and that's going to upset some people. Okay, so I'm going to take a little bit to build up to this next question. I just want to lay out, <laughs> lay out some Take things. it away, take it away. So I was reading about 
Christopher Wiley and, and Cambridge Analytica, the, the, the whistleblower for Cambridge Analytica. And Wiley talks about the connection between fashion and politics, how the style and trendiness and appearance of an idea is just as important or even more important as the, uh, than the idea itself, because you have to get someone to accept an idea in order for it to take hold. And I'm recording this from Brooklyn, where everything you eat and wear is about trends. I believe you're in LA. Another <laughs> yeah. things on the coast tend to be more trendy. And right now, hate speech, transgender issues, anti-gun are very trendy on the coasts. And, and people on the left take positions and want people to know about these positions, almost like a nice jacket you put on from All Saints. Mm -hmm. Like you want to show off your position. And many on the center and right tend to hold these secret positions for fear of being outed, like an old pair of sweatpants that you wear around your apartment, but you wouldn't be caught dead walking around with them on the street. And so, and uh, for example, people send you letters and ask you not to out them. Yeah. So it's my opinion that conservatives and people that aren't on the left, even more towards the middle, have done a terrible job at making their views trendy. Do you agree with that position? And if so, what can people that aren't on the left do to make their positions more fashionable to where it's like a, a something people want to be caught wearing? Dude, that is a great lead into a question. I love that because that's a different angle on, on so much of what I talk about. So first off, I'll tell you, I was born in Brooklyn before it was hipster Brooklyn. So mm -hmm. I was born in Brooklyn, lived in Brooklyn for three years. Then I grew up in Long Island. I lived in Manhattan most of my life. I went to SUNY Binghamton, upstate New York, and then I moved here seven years ago. So it's kind of funny because I'm a true, true New Yorker. And the only other place that I've lived in New York is LA. And yet my message and the things that I talk about is actually liked much more in the middle of the country. And in many ways is hated by the people in the coast. Not mm -hmm. everybody, of course, but broadly speaking. So that's an odd thing for me that I've tried to figure out what really is the reality of how that thing happened. One other thing on Brooklyn, you know, Brooklyn for now, where it's this hipster place and very expensive and you're right, there's so much virtue signaling and we have mm -hmm. barbecues in Brooklyn that, you know, it's $50 <laughs> for a piece of brisket and all of that stuff. Yeah. It's like Brooklyn became something that is so deeply different than what the ethos of Brooklyn once was. The idea of like the Brooklyn Dodgers and that it was this like lower class working place that my parent, my dad grew up in and my grandparents and great grandparents were in that when they had next to nothing. And it was all of these families that had come mostly from Europe with, you know, the, the same old story with just the bag and nothing else. And there were Italians and Greeks and Jews and Irish and black people. And everyone was sort of struggling together. Everyone kind of lived together, may have, may have had problems together, all of those things. It really was, there's a reason that Brooklyn, that so many people, uh, famous, important, relevant people in fashion and music, in comedy, mm -hmm. came from that. There really is a real reason for that. So when I see like the sort of new age hipster Brooklyn thing, it's, it's like an odd thing. Maybe that's just the way things evolve. But, but mm -hmm. to your point directly about how do you take the sort of time-tested good ideas that just don't feel trendy, like your old pair of sweatpants, I will give you a great metaphor, man. Well, in, in the last two months in Corona, I go out sometimes wearing sweatpants. I go out yeah. wearing my busted up sweatpants and my busted up t-shirts and my backwards hat and my freaking cracked Ray-Bans. And I go out there and nobody looks any weird. You know, I'm wearing a mask too. So I, I look like Cobra Commander on a bender, but like, you know, I, I'm just living my life. And I think that is the answer that somehow the left did the All Saints jacket thing really well. And this is not mm -hmm. a knock on All Saints. I've got some All Saints mm -hmm. shirts. This is, uh, how am yeah, I doing? I love All Saints. How, how, how am I doing here? This is um, Ted Baker. I, I, I kind of like this one. I feel oh, like they fit perfect. really well. Not bad, not bad, right? But I've got some All Saints. So this yeah. isn't a knock on All Saints. But your point was they figured out how to put on a jacket that looks right, but it doesn't necessarily mean that what's in the jacket or the production of the jacket or anything else is fine. So again, we're not making this about All Saints, but that, mm -hmm. that concept, right? And what the right, I think, did right was that they did get the ideas basically right, the ideas mm -hmm. of individual rights, of freedom, of getting the government out of the way, of getting personal responsibility. It's your life, capitalism, competition, all of those things. They did that right, but they didn't do the sales job because I think mm -hmm. they, were so, they were so into the idea portion of it 
that they didn't realize, oh, we got to win a culture war too. And that's why we see this disconnect right now, because the left said, our ideas actually, well, I don't know that they fully said this, but I think in essence what happened was, our ideas aren't that great. Let's just paint them up, get all the celebrities to buy in on all of this, call half the country racist and deplorable. And what does all this stuff do? Well, it's all about high taxes and moving money and blah, blah, blah. We'll mm -hmm. virtue signal the hell out of all of it and it'll come shiny. But look what has happened. That entire thing has started to collapse. We didn't even have a host at the Oscars because the, the Hollywood liberal elite no, no idiot comedian was willing to subject themselves to the outrage mm -hmm. mob that was going to come with it. So I think the right has a branding issue that you're probably right. They could use a couple, a couple kind of cool people to come in and be like, guys, the word conservative doesn't, it doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound right. Like progressive. Oh, I'm yeah. for progress. That's fun. We're for mm -hmm. progress, even if it doesn't mean anything. But conservative sounds old. It sounds like you're in a smoking jacket and you're talking like this to other people who are talking like this. So I think there is a branding issue. And, and I suspect because right now there is actually a lot of creativity and comedy coming out of the right that that, that thing will be addressed.